Uh, good morning and welcome to this virtual bridge session. And today it's going live on a Friday. And so for, for the powers of alliteration, it's going to be 15 fixies for Friday with a bit of audience participation. Um, of course, if you're watching the recording, it won't quite be the same, though hopefully you'll gain something from the insights of our audience here with us today. Today's session is going to involve three groups of five propositions as to things that we can do into the future to make life better for our learners. Um, it's going to cover both further and higher ed education, so the sort of integrated tertiary approach, and we're going to do it in three groups. The first group of five are immediate fixes, uh, the next group of five are sort of medium term, and the next lot, final lot, uh, will be about the more strategic long term. Are you excited yet, folks? I'm going to ask the audience to use the reaction buttons to give thumbs up, or indeed we could even go acoustic and do actual thumbs up on screen uh, as we go. Um, but these are going to be fairly fast and furious, and um, we're going to try and get some discussion going around them, and we'll come back at the end to each of the sets of slides. So I'm going to give the propositions quickly, you're going to vote, and then we are going to go back and discuss. Are we sitting well then? I didn't see comfortably. And so here we go. And it's the point where uh, I try and find which of the screens I'd like to share. And OK, five immediate fixes for Friday. Things I think we can do pretty much straight off the bat. Number one, fewer wordy slides on PowerPoints. Um, uh, again, even within JISC, uh, we have some people who are still using slides which are full of notes. Uh, for the speaker. We know that this is a comfort zone, but it's time we move away from that. And two thumbs up, three thumbs up so far. We've got general thumbs up, I think, for that. I think, uh, again, it's an interesting one because I think it's one that we all know about, but sometimes we can lapse. Number two, fewer emails. Um, it, as I go on, then emails require quite a lot of my time to sort, to delete, to what it wants to do, especially when it comes around to discussion. We've got other tools for doing that. And um, certainly in my world, IM has become um, so much better for getting quick response and discussion. And I can see we've got general support for fewer emails as well. Good to see. Thirdly, in terms of organizing teaching and learning, I'm going to suggest, and maybe this goes actually for the way in which we operate as members of staff ourselves, but more framework and less timetable. I was taken by the encouragement to high school teachers, um, especially in lockdown, um, for them to uh, set out at the beginning of the week what to be achieved and um, then a goal of trying to get it done that week without setting out a whole week's timetable. We do know that for some learners, indeed to the imposition of a week-long timetable, you must do this at this time of the day, has been difficult for them. But I think that's something we can put a, 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 along the, the, uh, the, across the educational spectrum, uh, that we look at setting out um, a framework to be achieved um, and then give opportunities at 10 o'clock till 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock till half past 10, when Jason will be around to ask questions um, at half past two till half past three and um, you can join group work activity in order to discuss that and some things that might be necessary to have timetabled slots where you need collaboration of course but on the whole i'm suggesting more framework less timetable i see a, a thumb up or two thumbs up and uh, we've got a new and, two, and yes and, and, and another one Shorter scheduled blocks. Um, I'm afraid I'm still stuck on an hour long block in terms of timetabling. My outlook is set to try and encourage me to do 50 minutes and then 20 minutes. But I think we need to move away from the default of one hour and multiples of one hour um, and have the timetabling support and the, uh, the whole institutional setup or organizational setup to allow that to happen. Are we in agreement of losing the one hour default? Okay, we've got two and two thinking about it. Excellent. We'll come back to those. Um, improving inclusion practice. Um, I've been involved in GIST for quite a long time now, and you, some of you who have been around uh, for a wee while might remember GIST Tectus and wonderful work that was done on using the uh, Microsoft Office tools uh, well. Um, and I, I dare say the participants here will be very good at using styles, for example, rather than just bolding and upping the font size, for example, in terms of documents. We've got simple inclusion practice techniques um, that still aren't commonplace. 
And so uh, my suggestion here is uh, that we up our game and we recognise as well all of us the, um, the improvements that have been made so far, um, but uh, we can still go further to ensure that everyone can get access to learning as in an easier manner as possible. I take it we're all on board with that. Nobody's going to say no to better in conclusion practice. Okay, that's immediate fixes. I think things that we can all get on board with now. What about then in the next year or two? What sort of other changes can we get? Medium term fixes for Friday. I will confess that I couldn't find a word for medium that began with F for alliteration purposes. So a small fail. So uh, there we go, which does alliterate. Uh, six, more team teaching. Um, I think uh, we have had a, in, across most of FE and HE situation where we expect uh, a person to be a lecturer or uh, indeed sometimes a tutor and in various other roles, but they're actually quite solitary roles. And I think we have to have a recognition in the longer term that there are going to be those who are absolutely fantastic in their subject area. Um, and, but maybe not so um, good uh, or um, they're, they're, um, they're um, capability and their uh, aptitude towards the some of the teaching skills and especially digital teaching and engagement skills uh, might not be their forte. And I think that putting together teams of people uh, with uh, their relative and complementary skills is going to be much more of the way forward rather than the isolated person. Of course, it has got its practical difficulties in how we do it. It's very easy just to uh, to say. Mr. X or Mrs. Y, uh, you've got class Z and leave it be. However, I think we need the structure and the framework in order to support uh, team teaching. Are we on board with that? It should really be a thumbs down symbol as well, but um, we've got, okay, three votes there and uh, one more depends if you want to come back to. Seven, um, less time required on campus. Um, again, I see there's been a default of, of, of being at college or at university and um, expecting students to be there. And then the question sometimes of what do we do with the students once they're there? We've done this in a context of knowing that for some students actually being on campus is a difficult thing to achieve with work-life balance or even simply geography in regional colleges in particular. Um, so my proposal is that um, the, we can lower the amount of time required on campus and doing that by revisiting the learning activities we're expecting students to do and asking, are they required to be on campus? Note that I'm saying requirements. Of course, there are students and, and uh, uh, they will be um, eased, they'll have their situation helped by being able to find a quiet space with the right facilities. So uh, it's not about closing off access to campuses, but it's about revisiting the requirement to be there. Sound sensible? Yeah, thumbs up there. And the, there's a corollary of that, We're valuing on-campus time as well. If we have dragged a student, and, and dragged being used as for effect here, um, on two buses to get to uh, at the campus, if they've come off a night shift because they're having to work and coming in, then we better give them the best experience whilst they're on campus. And I think it goes with, uh, again, the last point um, that where we do have students on campus, we have to make sure that that time makes best use of the fact that they have um, they can come to the campus. Um, that might mean uh, some things we need to do with the space to allow the, the right things to take place. Um, and we have, we, I think we all probably know uh, campus facilities where if a student comes in at a busy time of day, and by busy I mean high demand, then um, it's difficult for them to find a quiet space to do work on, on a computer, for example. And if they don't have the ability to do that um, at their home or where they're staying in accommodation, um, then that, that's a difficulty. Um, also, uh, let's face it, that uh, we have been for quite some time, maybe more so in higher education, um, expecting students to come in, sit in a lecture and, and receive um, a didactic approach um, and for some students they may wish, wish to be there in person but uh, there may be many students for whom access to that can be done at a different place or at a different time so it's about revisiting that so valuing on-campus time is my uh, plea there more so than at the moment general thumbs up more learning design support. Um, I think uh, th this is already happening and, um, and over the past year we've seen it there. Um, but what is clear is that we can't and shouldn't uh, leave 
uh, teaching staff um, alone that they need support in being able to rethink about how they deliver their subject. I, th I think we've moved on from maybe once upon a time, indeed, when I was a lecturer, uh, where some of my colleagues um, had, were teaching the same way uh, they had always taught, and indeed were teaching the way that they were taught um, without that. I think we're breaking free of that to some extent, or to a large extent indeed, um, but um, the ability to step back, think again about how learning is, uh, is delivered or, or facilitated, um, and look at all the different uh, mechanisms that we now have available to us, I think is very, is very, um, uh, is very enticing, uh, it's a great opportunity, uh, but staff do need uh, further support in that. So um, my plea here is for more learning design support and, part, uh, and also sorting the structures that allow staff to do that. Uh, if we are in a situation, for example, where staff are on contracts that they finish up at the end of May uh, or sometime in June, and then they come back on campus just as teaching restarts, and then when is the revisiting learning design going to happen? So, and more learning design support, I'm guessing we'll have thumbs up across the board for that. Who wouldn't vote for that after all? Excellent. More micro-credentialing. Um, uh, not everyone's lives obviously fits around full time and we have got significant part time numbers in uh, both further and higher education, um, but um, still what we need is um, a, a greater rollout, I think, of uh, recognition of uh, uh, the smaller level, the more granular skills. Um, that is a, a general direction, uh, but I think it's something that has to take place. It fits in with uh, uh, with obviously what people are looking for, the needing uh, skills now here uh, in immediacy. So micro-credentialing, we're going for that. Okay, we've got a mix there. That's uh, fine, we're a good point for discussing. And now on to the bigger strategic fixes for Friday. Uh, better capability tracking. Um, so uh, still we have got students, uh, again, maybe applies more to higher education than further education, though it's still applicable to both, uh, where at various stages we test their ability to do something and then leave it. Um, I think actually we all recognise that what we should have is um, a growing test and a, a, a longitudinal test of the development of skills and aptitudes um, uh, for our learners. And, and something that continues to grow. That's something that is, that is happening, but again, I think it has to be more there. So um, I, again, the days are gone, hopefully, of when I was a law student, as it happened, um, I did an exam, got the tick against the module, moved on, collected sufficient modules for me to be given a degree. Uh, that's what it came about to. Uh, um, and there was nothing that tested uh, my ability to deliver uh, my speech, uh, interestingly. I said nothing about uh, my ability to negotiate or compromise in a, a meeting and, and those sort of um, skills. So um, I, I think uh, again, I'm seeing sort of spider diagrams and such, and uh, and people understanding, learners understanding better um, the areas in which their skills need to develop through time and also through flexibility, being given the time to develop the skills um, rather than it being in blocks. So better capability tracking. I've got a general thumbs up there. Choice of how to learn. Um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking here of second year property law. Now, second year property law happened at nine o'clock to 11 o'clock on a Thursday morning. I wasn't, when I was a student, a very morning person. And Wednesday night was student night, and I wasn't often very good on a Thursday morning. Um, the first property law uh, class I went uh, and uh, I was in my kilt and um, uh, went up to the back of the lecture theatre, flat lecture theatre, 100 people in it, and uh, there were no seats left, so um, I just laid in and unfortunately slept through it. Um, but I did actually pick up which textbook was being used. Um, I had uh, rudiments of a framework of what I needed to know, and I, um, I read the textbook, studied it, learned the stuff. Uh, I think I attended one more class out of the 18 I was supposed to, um, but got on with it. Uh, my how to learn was self-driven, independent at the times I liked. Nobody asked me that at the beginning. They just wanted me to turn up at nine o'clock on a Thursday morning. I think there are, we know from the lockdown circumstances, we have got students that have thrived and students that have struggled. Um, and what we need to do is be better understanding how our learners will best learn. 
Um, now, there, there are limits, obviously, to that, both in practical terms and in terms of the skills we want them to develop. But overall, I think uh, we need to give learners uh, a better choice of how to learn. Would you agree? Okay, so, uh, mixed views. Uh, yeah, oh no, how about across the board there? Um, let's get more techie. Me, more AI-based support. I think artificial intelligence um, can play an important role in amplifying uh, the uh, the human elements of uh, staff and, and lecturers and coming in, identifying points where, uh, where human input is needed, but also uh, to encourage and support students in their learning. And this goes back to what got me into all of this. Um, I created a JavaScript question engine to ask um, a large class of business law students self-assessment questions, um, and they got fairly hooked on it. And they had 300 students all going away at this fairly rudimentary self-assessment test and um, for some it was because they were quite interested in the subject for others it was gamification they wanted to get 100 percent and they found out it was a bank of questions being used and that's not ai being used of course but what ai can do is give a better more personalized support for students uh, but not taking away where the human element is best deployed and so that's what i'd like to see so can we see the place for more ai based support in, uh, I think we'd all love to double or treble the number of people delivering in further and higher education, but given that's not going to happen, then I think AI is one of the mechanisms we can amplify the human support. Increase work project-based learning. Um, I went through a law degree without ever seeing a client or anyone playing the part of a client or having anything to do with a law firm other than recruitment fairs. Things have moved on since I did law, uh, so I'm pleased to say. But actually, I think there's very few subjects now which don't benefit uh, from contact with the real world, if you like, the outside world, the industry with which they're connected, let's put it. Um, and indeed, most uh, of our education system does do that, I think, to some extent. But And we've seen the increase in project-based learning, especially of late. So, but my, um, my thought is that uh, we're going to be in a world of in increasing uh, work-based learning and project-based learning uh, too. Are we in agreement with that one? Okay, there's, uh, yeah, and we'll come back to that for some discussion. I think, oh, it's across the board. And finally, a broader range of qualifications. Uh, I was quite taken um, uh, by the uh, project, uh, so the Poland University system of collecting stamps, little stamps in a book. And um, each stamp was a recognition in its own right of a particular uh, subject area's competence. And when you had enough stamps, you went along and you could go to the registry and get a degree if you had the right stamps. Um, it did take an awful lot away from the uh, the burden of working out subject combinations and all the rest of it. The responsibility was on the student to get the right stamps. Came along with the wrong stamps, just said, nah, you're not getting your degree, go and get a, another stamp, a blue stamp. So um, it, it was an interesting one there. But I think uh, the, the point of that is um, that uh, we, we uh, in higher education, of course, we did uh, look at, and there still is the certificate of higher education, diploma in higher education, as well as degree and then honours degree. We don't really hear much about certificates and diplomas. We still have a fairly standardised and fairly narrow set of qualifications to aim for. Uh, maybe we should be broadening that to allow better access to education. Um, and I, again, I, I think there has been quite a lot of um, uh, effort made in further education, particularly about doing that. But if a person has got a couple of hours at odd places in the week in between their work and life to fit in learning, do we have the qualifications to meet that? And I think the answer is not always. Uh, and maybe we should do. Um, and for some people, it might look like levels of a game where you're taking the boxes and gradually uh, being able to say that uh, I achieved level three in whatever it is and uh, and yeah uh, I, th I think that sometimes appeals to the gamers more than uh, uh, than anyone else but still uh, that um, it comes back to micro credentialing in a way but it means building up qualifications uh, without necessarily having the big qualification uh, as the default um, in, in, in the background. 
Okay, so we're looking for a broader range of qualifications. Oh, that might complicate matters, of course. So that's the insight. I think on the whole, then we're going there. But that there takes me to the end of this and leads me on to then comments about uh, uh, about these and which ones you uh, either feel that are the wrong way to go um, or ones you would like to give particular support for. I should have really uh, had a slide with all 15 on them, but uh, let's go back and start the conversation around five immediate fixes for Friday. Anyone got any particular vote? Or are these so uh, apple pie that you reckon that there's none you could uh, contend with? Feel free to open your mics. I'm I'm going to make a, an argument for for three, I I agree that there should be flexibility, but I still value some timetabling in in my lessons. I, I think some people need some structure, and and some people need more <laughs> than less. So as as long as there's a basic timetable, but more flexibility within that to do things, I I agree with your point. So I'm thinking of a situation that was a long time ago, but um, I, uh, I had a, a family member who was ill and uh, twice had to repeat and had to repeat years because he had missed some learning and was told, well, you can only restart this time next August. And that happened twice. And uh, it got me thinking of, well, why can't they just take up at the point they, 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 they can? And th there is a, sometimes a reason. Sometimes you need to be with a cohort of other learners doing the same. And that's that's a practical limit. So um, it's not always the case. Anyone can do it at any time. And in terms of practicality, I appreciate we need some structure uh, for that. But I think we can need to move still more in the, in the direction of flexibility to support learners. Do you agree, Kenji? I, I agree. I, I think the, the practicalities of how we do that probably do depend, like you've said, in other areas around the infrastructure, the funding, etc. But yes, in, in principle, I, I think that's a good idea. And uh, I, I like Lizzie's point, which she's not able to, to voice because of <laughs> the context in which she's currently working at the moment. Yeah. So she she said um, she'd argue for smarter emails rather than less, and that we need emails and instant messages more than previously to support the asynchronous working, but we should make sure that every email is relevant and necessary. So dealing with a large number of peoples within the sector, what I see is um, a, a sort of effect of overload. And that is, I know if an email is going to disappear off a person's screen southwards, um, then it's probably not going to, the person's going to find it difficult to come back to it. And um, and that's a product of uh, the, the many demands on everyone's time at the moment is not because of any lack of prioritization. So I, I think we do need emails, that's undoubtedly true. Um, the, though the, um, I think there are, we, we all come across, I'm sure, instances of discussion being attempted by, a, by email and, uh, and uh, yeah, they trying to sort out the thread of discussion. And I know there are tools within um, email clients to help with this, um, but still, uh, I think it's uh, email is used as a default tool rather than any consideration of whether it's the most appropriate. But yeah, yes. we do need the place for asynchronous working as well, and it's a good point. Yeah, I would agree with that, um, Jason. A, a group I'm working with, it's taken me a whole year to pers finally persuade them that uh, they should be using Teams um, in a more constructive way for dialogue and, and information and, and to get it off email. But if you don't keep on the, on the case, the default's always email. Oh, I'll just email. I know how to do that. It's easy to do. I've got people in my list, you know, my group list. So it, it's, it's just too handy if we made email more difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought um, the idea of a, um, a, a, a ration, a, a certain number of um, emails, everyone gets a quota a day to send. 
uh, would be pretty good, but uh, maybe would think people would think about it a little bit more. There's also those times as well, and I have to say that um, and there are other tools available, but uh, uh, the fact that Teams, the fact that a growing number of people, I can see people's availability straight off. I can tag their availability as well and deal with things with a five minute discussion that might have taken emails back and forward over weeks. Um, it is, is fantastic. Um, but um, I, I, and um, I do remember one conversation about 10 years ago, admittedly, about people and their email practices. And one of the questions was, well, why do people like emails? And uh, there was an awful lot of response that says, because I've got evidence. Let's, uh, and I thought that's, that's a somewhat negative um, uh, uh, reason, but um, I think it has to be recognised as well. And there are some things that are discussed and agreed on that do need to be put in writing, uh, I'll accept. Moving on then to the immediate ones then, we've got a few minutes left. Any of those particularly pique anyone's uh, interest or passion or, uh, or disagreement indeed, Kenji? I don't. I don't want badges. I. I. I I've lost my love for badges and and that aspect of micro credentialing, because I, I. I think there was too much emphasis, and they only had an impact on the local ecosystem. And once you stepped outside the college or the university, they tended to lose all meaning. So it, it depends on the application of micro credentialing, but in the way that it's done at the moment, not so much. Yeah, um, I was taking again on that and uh, by, uh, again, it was quite a few years ago and I think things have moved on, thankfully, but uh, uh, someone in the world of medicine and teaching was explaining how uh, more or less the limbs can get aggregated and so um, a grade of 70% might have been a solid pass in the arm, but a marginal fail in leg. And if you've got a problem with your leg, then <laughs> you might want to know that. So um, maybe it's um, maybe not, <laughs> the credentialing is maybe about showing in more detail. And again, there's other ways of doing that within qualifications. And I know that's not necessarily micro-credentialing. Um, how it works uh, is a good question. And I think we do need schemes and uh, yeah, the, the multiple badge schemes and, and such, um, uh, yeah, doesn't really take off. And uh, maybe the question is what would go into people's CVs? What does a CV look like into the future? How do we record what people have done and validate what people have done indeed? Um, but uh, I think that can be done on a, a lower uh, level. But And again, Lizzie, your point, I think, is uh, echoing um, what Kenji said there. Yes, indeed. That's, um, Okay, any further ones on uh, reflections on those? Yes, uh, just say that yeah. eight, really you have to do eight and nine together. The, the, the only proper way of making sure on campus time is, is valuable to the student is to have your learning design sorted. <laughs> Absolutely. That's my feeling about it. Yeah. And I think an important point is um, I, I, yeah, avoiding, for me, defaults, um, thinking afresh from first principles about what we're trying to do and the best way of doing it, um, because many of the models that we've had beforehand still come from um, historic practice uh, in different times. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, I think uh, starting from learning design is a very good place to be. And finally, then, on to the, the strategic fixes for Friday. Any views on those? I'm, I'm just going to put in for Lizzie because she did mention in the chat Thank you. that she was conscious in terms of AI that you, you need serious discussions around the data privacy issues associated with that. Uh, indeed, indeed. And I think the, the most important thing is to get the learner on board and understanding what is happening and above all else, why. And uh, again, AI here, I'm suggesting is solely to improve the support of the students, uh, to give the student better and understand how that's going. And also for maybe to give the, importantly, I think to give the learners the ability to come back and say, actually what has been suggested for me um, it was the wrong thing, or I think is the wrong thing as well. And so this support doesn't look right to me. Um, and, and deal with a human on that as well. So it's certainly not a panacea, and I don't think it's something as well that should be, be hidden as happening. I think uh, we, we need to be upfront. Uh, again, we know about uh, the 
uh, experience of bots being able to replicate humans to such an extent that people don't know and possibly the uh, I'm sure it was at MIT and I don't know whether it's a, um, one of those stories with any truth or not but the fact that they introduced a couple of seconds delay into the bot responses um, and everyone was a bit more happy with it because they felt it was a human answering whereas a uh, bot was giving the uh, the instant responses and clearly was a bot responding and people weren't so happy about that so it wasn't actually the quality of the responses. It was more whether people felt they were being dealt with by machine or human. I think we need to be upfront about what people are dealing with. I think that is true about the way in which the data is used, not extend the use of data uh, for other purposes um, without gaining the buy-in of people because uh, that, that it, it does lead to rejection. Uh, but, uh, but again, making clear what we don't want to use this for is simply improving the experience and the support for learners so they attain better. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, 15 fixes for Friday covering three different levels. I think we've had general agreement and we can adopt them all. It's an important time now that we have the SFC review of coherent provision and sustainability ongoing, and especially looking at how we support the digital revolution for learners, defining what that means and how we support it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. <laughs>